Not so oh, good evening. Hello, how are you all? Um, my name's Ina. I'm part of the Good Practice team in the Wales Audit Office. You're listening in live to our key issues for regional partnership boards. Cross the Cynnes i pawb sy'n gwrando mewn hynno, NWD Ina Lloyd, dwi'n rhan o'r tîm yma bedarf, a dwi'n yma hynno i rhannu ynglynion yn ei dda prif heriau bwrdau partneriau thrombarthol. So, you're listening live to a webinar and we're in the beautiful surroundings of the Morgan Cricket Club. Thank God we have got air conditioning on this evening. So I talk a lot to our team behind the camera, so let me introduce you. The most important person I've got to keep my eye on tonight is Miss Sarah. Hello, Miss Sarah. Hello. You all right? Very well, thank you. Gitto, nos with that issue. Good afternoon. Doing iawn, diolch. Miss Bethan, should we tea? Good afternoon, Ah, Bethan. Doing iawn? Hello. So that's the team behind the camera. So look, we're trying something a bit different tonight. We've got a live audience here as well. So um, I'll be we're acknowledging them, saying hello to them. Good evening, folks. How are you? You all right? Good, good, lovely. So it's something a bit different because people have requested to actually um, be a part of the mm -hmm. webinar live, having a live experience. So I'd very much welcome your thoughts on how this is going for you this evening, if that's okay. So let's introduce who's around the table. Abigail, do you have to introduce yourself to this? Good evening. Yes. Hi, I'm Abby Harris, and I'm the Director of Strategic Planning and Cards and Vale Health Board. Um, and I sit on the Cardiff and Vale RPB. I'm also an independent member on the Social Care Wales Board, so I know Sue very well, indeed. Abby, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Stephen, good evening. Good evening. I'm Steve Carr. I am the Safe Communities Programme Manager, working on behalf of the Welsh Government Association of Government and Policing in Wales. I come from a background of managing partnerships, and I'm currently managing a partnership in the programme itself, which is a multi agency. Stephen, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Ina. Uh, my name is Rachel Rowlands. I'm uh, the Chief Executive of Age Connects Magano, and the Director of Age Connects Wales, and I'm the Chair of the Cuntaf Magano Regional Partnership Board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, Sue. Hi there. I'm Sue Evans, Chief Executive of Social Care <coughs> Wales. My previous line was Director of Social Services in Torbay when the RPPs were just being established, so I'm using some of that experience tonight. Thank you very much. Hello, Duncan. Hello. My name is Duncan McKenzie. I'm the strategic lead for partnership support at Data Cymru. Uh, Data Cymru is part of the local government family providing support and advice to local authorities on using data and information. And my role focuses on our interaction and work with RPBs and PSVs. Duncan, you're very welcome. Thank you very Thank much. You. Last but not least, Chris. Hello. Hello, yeah. It's really weird saying hello to someone you sit next to all do every day. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself to the yeah. delegates, please? Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Bolton. I'm part of the Wales Audit Office Good Practice Exchange Team. I haven't been involved in a long time in audit, looking at partnerships, but last year I spent some time with the Winston Churchill Trial and Fellowship looking at partnerships in places like the Basque Country and New England, which I'll refer to later on. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And you're fine. You're very welcome as well. Now, Many of you are listening in, the majority of you are part of regional partnership boards. So you will know that there's a study coming out shortly on the 18th of July. That study will be published by the Wales Audit Office. This is a natural follow on from what uh, has been shared at the feedback sessions to many of you. But so there's a core purpose tonight, and this is simply this these, these webinars, because there's two, there's one here tonight in Cardiff. And then next week, there's another one in uh, Glass Deal Business Centre up in Conway, in Tandros and Conway. Just putting sort of a bit of sort of a context of why we're here, the webinars are about providing all the regional partnership board members with time for reflection. Thinking about what our lovely panel members will be sharing with you tonight. How does that feel with you? You know, sort of, is it resonating? Does it make sense? Is it sort of challenging your thinking? Let us know because you are actually very much part of tonight. So I'm now going to share with you and our live audience how are you going to get in touch with us. So let's so you can use email. It's good.practice at audit.wales. If you happen to have a Google account, you can actually um, open your new Google account and have a little chat with everybody who's listening in with a Google chat on the side of the uh, YouTube account. Another way is on Twitter. So you can either uh, follow us at Good Practice WAO and share your messages there. And the hashtag is WAO RPBs. No, get, no points for guessing what the RPBs actually stand for. And finally, there's a new way we've started doing this. It's called menti.com. 
So if you tap into your phones or your iPads on Dementi.com, it'll ask you for a code, and the code is 591918. They've written it for me over there because I'm rubbish memory for remembering stuff like that. I remind you in the course of the evening, can I just say to anyone, whether it's the audience here live or those listening in remotely, all questions are totally anonymized. So if you've got a thought or comment to make, please share it, because if you're thinking it, I can show you lots of others. So I've introduced the team, I've introduced the panel. I think it's time we started this webinar. So Rachel, mm -hmm. why this topic? What do you think? What's what you know? What what the question I kind of need to ask you? Sort of, are PPs really sort of know what good might look like in the context? Because when you think about the health of Wales and everything, what would be your opening response be to delegates listening in? Well, I think the the, the, the first thing is that of course uh, RPBs need to decide what good looks like for them. That's the first thing. Yeah. Because if they if they uh, if they just go about the how do we do all of this without understanding. What it is they're trying to achieve and actually uh, there's a, a great deal of time and I presume would be many wasted with all of the people in the room. Uh, so really strong governance is important and strong governance uh, should be evident in the way that uh, partnership boards plan, support one another and develop as a collective and I think that's really important. Uh, it's, a, it's a strong characteristic of partnership where people feel they're in it together and that they're not three or four or four, five uh, different individual members coming together every six weeks uh, to try and talk about how they're going to spend an awful lot of money. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> I would say strong governance is definitely a feature of uh, a good partnership board. Um, and also that, uh, you know, progress needs to be made, but there's nothing wrong in stopping and saying actually this isn't working. And uh, having, having uh, goals and, and uh, outcomes to achieve and knowing when you're on the right track is really important. Uh, equally knowing when you're on the wrong track is also important. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thanks for opening there, Rachel. Stephen, so what's your thoughts? What does a successful RPB look like to you, wearing your hat in terms of partnerships and in terms of governance? Um, a successful RPB would break out of its RPB site there <coughs> and recognise that everything is connected to everything. Yeah. Um, needs to really fundamentally adopt the sustainable development principle of the Hans the Mother and Future Generations Act and use that as it's, whatever it does, that has to be done through the five ways of working. Um, and very importantly, I think we need to stop thinking of partnership as extra and added to the day job. Yeah. It is the day job, um, <clears throat> which means that it, when you sit around those partnership boards, you have to take back <clears throat> the, the sort of thinking around service design, collaboration, back to the ranch yeah. and fundamentally change the way you do things and you deliver things. And that actually might mean conceding certain things that if partnership doesn't actually fundamentally and radically alter the way you do your day job, partnership isn't working. Wow, really good statement to start off with. Thank you very much. So folks, I'm going to give you ample opportunity. Don't <coughs> feel you've got to keep your questions to right at the very end. If something pops into your head, someone's caused a reaction, please post them in. But I'm going to turn to Sue now to actually start looking at the specific questions. I'm going to address them. Sue, can you open and give me a, your thoughts on what does good like look like in terms of measuring outcomes and how do you get there? Okay, thanks. Sue, for that. <laughs> it's a good starting point. Right, and I think uh, for me, outcomes are useful because they help you focus on what citizens want and what citizens want. So you move away from an activity target or an outcome based on your professional judgment or a role that you're performing. And because we know people's lives are complex, it means that trying to achieve an outcome means many people have to get involved. It can't be up to one individual professional or one individual organisation. So I think it forces you to stop and think, why are we here? So it builds on uh, you know, what Steve has just said. It's about being clear on what the purpose is and using outcomes are a good way of really testing out does each of the partners play their part, what is their contribution. So things like results-based accountability, logic model, theory of change, mm -hmm. they're probably more useful when you're thinking about measuring outcomes. It's very difficult to measure outcomes from an uh, individual organisational point of view or an individual uh, activity or professional point of view. So for me, outcomes give us those uh, much more of a citizen-focused approach. The other thing for me is um, the 
lost my track. I'll find this in a minute. Take a turn. Things like commissioning services. Um, you know, the tradition has been you're buying things or you're planning services based on activity levels. If we are thinking about outcomes, we have to change the way we commission or plan services. Frontline very often know what needs to improve. Yeah. Uh, so for me, there's something about uh, commissioning for outcomes. It's much more difficult to do, but it is the right thing to do, uh, and it is complex. So thanks, great look there. Thanks very much. Thank you. So Rachel, as a chair of a regional partnership board, for you, what does good like good look like in terms of measuring outcomes? And again, how do you get there? Uh, similarly to what Sue said, you know, I mean, I think success and progress is it can only be measured by what it can say. We need to uh, we need to do much, much, much more around citizen stories and understanding the impact that uh, that solutions uh, and, and interventions can have on people's lives. I think all too often, you know, it's all about what project leads and officers think, and actually the outcomes are. Uh, are sometimes far too focused on the outcome for the uh, the authority or the, the public body that's actually delivering the service. Um, early agreement by all partners on what the outcome is going to be is really important. Not to get too hung up on the individual roles and capacity of each partner, and you know if the system needs to be broken, break the system uh, and start again. Because I think again, far too often, you know, we see uh, services wrapped around systems and people fitted into systems. Uh, as, as Steve said, you know, we, we probably need to go back to basics and say if something doesn't change back at the ranch for each of the individual partners, then um, the partnership isn't working. Um, I think also I would say this, of course, being a third sector representative, but I do think a well-supported social value sector is central to achieving co-production, and I think authorities health authorities and local authorities are, <coughs> don't understand co-production in the same way that the third sector does and they need to use that asset much, much, much more. Um, and of course, if we do uh, if, if we do this right, then actually the 20% allocation that's come from Welsh Government in this round of funding should increase to 30 and 40% in years to come because we'd like to see less people coming into services, into statutory services, more people being supported uh, by their communities, by their friends, by their families, uh, and by community groups. So that's what I would say uh, uh, measuring outcomes is all about, yeah. making sure that you can feel it in the community. We often get a phrase that all panel members pick up from one uh, the, from one of the panel members. I think the early lead here is back at the ranch. Mm -hmm. that's it. So yes. thank you very much. Um, I think the back of the ranch is, I'm seeing some questions coming in now. So I'm just giving you a heads up, Steve, that, that there's a back, back of the ranch question coming to you. But before that, what's your thought? Uh, on the responses, <coughs> and what would you like to share? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we use the cliche, what, get, what gets measured gets done. Yeah. And all too often we focus on what's easy to measure yeah. rather than trying to work out you know, what it is we need to be measuring. Okay. And, and data development to actually measure that. Sometimes we just don't put the effort into it. And particularly, you, know, you made the point about um, the organisations are, are looking at outcomes that suit them. Actually, a lot of that's driven by the funding. And the fact that um, the funders themselves, what's government, UK government, other funders, struggle with outcomes based thinking, and so they keep asking for bean counting, which is a better word. Yeah. Um, and, and what we're talking about are very complex issues, mm. and they're not easy to measure. And I think the funders themselves, the mind organisations, have to actually accept that and say, well, you know, we need to give people the, the liberty and the room to explore new ways and different ways of working that may not actually yield you know, outcomes that are immediately measurable by the next election. So I think we just need to break that stuff. Okay, brave words then. I love the word, the, the lovely use of the word liberty. I like that, thank you. So Duncan, from Data Cameron's point of view, in terms of measuring outcomes, how do they get there? I will agree with what the um, previous panelists have said. I, I'll, I'll slightly disagree. I, I still think that performance data, understanding what organisations and services do, that is still important and services and organisations need to understand what they do and how often and how frequently and how much it costs them. Mm -hmm. However, that isn't as important as understanding what impact their services have. And the only way you can really measure the impact of services is by talking to the people who receive or use those services. Um, that is a difficult and relatively expensive thing to do compared to collecting performance data, but it is the most important data and without it, services 
have no meaning, you don't understand whether what you're doing is the right thing. The other difficulty with getting good impact data by asking service users is that you are relinquishing the most important thing about measuring the quality of your services to the people who are possibly the harshest critics, and that's culturally quite a difficult thing for organisations to to get used yeah. to. You're having a lot of nods around the table <coughs> you've already said there, so I think it's quite a lot of support for what you're saying there. Thanks, thank you. Abby, do you want to come in mm -hmm. on this one? Yeah, thanks, Ina. I mean, I think for me there are there are two levels. Um, the first is about um, what everyone else here has said already around citizens. So for me, um, it's really thinking about what was important to the citizen. How can we measure the outcome for the citizen? Um, and I do think we come from the place where we do like to over intervene. Um, we, um, we're not using people's own strengths, um, and there's a lot more work we can do around really capturing um, when we're thinking about um, an individual, how we can support them to deliver the outcomes that really matter to them, um, not what matter to us as, a, as um, providers of services. And I think the second bit then is about the system measures. And just reflecting on what Duncan was saying, um, one of the things we are trying to look at in RPD is, um, as system leaders responsible in through the RPD for the whole system, really looking at what are the, the handful of dials that we, we can look at to enable us to see that we are achieving the system shift um, that we um, want to um, through our planning and, and system redesign. Um, and, and sometimes we get caught up in the hundreds of performance indicators that sit below that, and it's really quite hard on the dashboard mm. to see the wood for the trees, really. So we're really trying to think about what other five, six, seven, ten indicators that from an RPB um, perspective, um, right the way through the system, we are able to judge um, are we getting the change across our system as, as quickly as possible, and is it is it at the scale we need to enable us to um, to shift resources and to see the outcomes for citizens. So for me, it's at those two levels. Okay, thank you. Abby, it's a lovely answer. Thank you. Thanks for that. Chris, do you want to wrap up the thoughts here for this particular question? I'm, such a, I'm not sure I've had anything more sensible than what's been said. Um, just two things. One about it's a complex system, and the other bit is the story is the measure. And yeah. the point's been made that if this is partnerships are typically brought together to deal with complex problems. And the very nature of a complex problem that predicting outcomes is a really hard thing to do so if you're going to set outcome measures on something you can't really predict there's a question of what on earth you're doing in the first place people like dave snowden and toby lowe have talked about this toby lowe ran a workshop in wales back in march where this was pointed out and was um came up with an example from plymouth where the commission i think it's adult social care services about 80 million and set no outcome measures on the procurement process other than some things about learning in a, this recognition, it's a really difficult thing to do in a complex process. Something we're trying to get hold of some of the detail on. Um, the second point about the story is the measure, it's been mentioned earlier. The people who not really know what's going on in that system are the people who are experiencing it. So um, understanding what their story is and measuring that, the good things about that, and the point of um, all the other measures that has been touched on is they get gained by people who yeah. set a target, what was the phrase? People who what get measured gets done. Yeah. So actually, if people are gaming the targets, if you measure what people are saying, that's really hard. The point said, but that's expensive. There's examples. Um, there are two consumers up there, and Katie there were involved in measuring the mounting that went extensively into gathering people's stories using SenseMaker to analyze them to get an understanding. So measuring the mounting, I think, gives us a sense of this can be done, and it wasn't that expensive, I don't think. No, it was a nod, it wasn't. So it's, it, was, it was something that can be done around actually. <coughs> I'll come back to the story is the measure. Okay, so do you want to come back in quickly? Because yeah. I, there's loads of questions just, coming in, just got to tell panel members. Just on this. as an appeal to our PBs to really think about using their Cinesa panels. Uh, you know, okay. I'm aware that there's lots of different varieties across Wales, but that's which data there is. Okay, so let's put that out to Twitter then. What do you want to say on Twitter? It's an appeal for them to use those citizen panels okay. and really get that voice from the citizen. Okay, that's lovely. Talking of citizen panels, I've got a really beautifully long question here, which I'll read in a minute, but I've got a couple of observations coming on Twitter. Folks, thank you very much for your questions. Really, really appreciate it. The first observation is this one. Real, real partnerships plus collaboration equals respect of all parties, including the volunteer service users. That's the first observation. Right, Stephen, I did promise you a question and here it comes. I will read it twice if you have a think about this. 
I agree that RPB's activity should be seen as the day job. However, how does one cascade that approach effectively in a large organization like a health board? That's a very fair question. I'm going to read it once again to give you time to have a think about it because it's, it's, I know it's a tricky question, but let's see if we can unpick it. So let's, let's have a go at this. I agree that RPB activity should be seen as the day job. However, how does one cascade that approach effectively in a large organization like a health board? Yes. And breathe. Okay, <laughs> let's go over there, shall we? I've never, worked, I've never worked for a health board, but I've spent years and years trying to engage health board officials and officers in partnership with them. Um, unlike local authorities, unlike police forces, unlike lot partners, there's no obvious command and control structure. So there's no clear, you know, you can have a health board representative sat around the partnership table. And absolutely no guarantees that those messages, those things you're talking about, are going to get back to okay. the ethical board. So, what I would say is take a completely different approach, <clears throat> and it's more about the collaborative commission of service. Okay. Which, as long as you sort of co, -co design and you, you, you conduct your needs uh, gaps analysis, you do service user engagement, you design the service, you work out what it is you need, yeah. and let the health board worry about. Whose job it is to work with okay. to to go to, uh, commission that process. Okay, thank you very much for that. Panel, I want you to sit back for a minute and have a listen to this message and read it slowly. It's quite a long one, but I feel I have to read this out. So this message has come from a citizen um, just trying to find the, the their role here. Um, as a citizen. I just want to see an effective, sustainable service. I don't care which legal entity it sits under. And to capture good based around what matters to me in question, we need to transform the way we identify issues around people, not processes and organisational structure. It goes on. I recognise organisations have different points and different cultures and methods of working, but if you're to truly develop transformational services, they need to have a look and identify resources in a different way. So this is the question to come into the panel now. I felt I needed to give you context what they're saying there. So are you ready for this? How does the panel view the need to develop a set of challenging principles and ethos in the way RPB works? Currently, RPBs develop bland vision statements, which can be all seen, uh, all easily agreed on, not to upset any partners, but the statutory third sector citizen care representatives who sit around RPBs. So how can partners in RPBs introduce more challenging ways of working to help frame the questions you've asked tonight? Thank you for your question, really appreciate it. I need to give the panel time for that to sink in. Do you need me to read any other part of it or is anyone happy to have a go to this? Me too. Yes, please. Something that, that I've referred to quite a bit is um, <clears throat> the, the late Audrey Morgan, First Minister of Wales. I think most people are familiar with his clear and water speech, where he's trying to talk about the differences between Westminster Labour and, and Cardiff Bay Labour. Um, and the focus is on the sort of policy differences, but in that speech, he actually talks about a one public service or one's approach. Okay. And I think you know that is where we need to be getting to this is to stop thinking in terms of power to police, local government, etc. etc. And just okay. think in terms of the public service spend for Wales, okay. or equally the public service spend for Robin and Tap and Earth, okay. but mm -hmm. wherever it might be. And think how do we design a public single public service that is fit for the citizens of this place okay. and for the individuals and to, to stop breaking it into health policing and okay. health governments and health. Okay. Stephen has started off with a response to your question. Is that getting in the area where you think you're looking at? Does another panel member want to come back? And Abby, do you want to go on that one? I think it, it, it comes back to something I need to do in the first question, which is about actually what are we all there to do in the first place? We're, we are there to think about how can we make it better for um, the citizen in, in the patch that we're working. And we're really trying to do some work where we um, we focus our thoughts. We're using a character called WIN. Um, so we are trying to make sure we have our conversations, which is, okay, so how are we going to make this better? Win? Leave your organisational baggage at the door um, and come in and, and not think about what well, oh that's coming out of my budget or how we're going to manage this, but think about actually what's the right thing to do for the citizens. And I think sometimes we put the barriers in the way from our frontline staff being able to do the right thing. Wow. I think quite often 
um, they have got lots of good ideas and ways of cutting through the bureaucracy and the different ways of working. And again, one of our jobs as system leaders should be to help break those things down, to enable them to do the right thing. And if that's spending a bit more on um, domiciliary care that's coming out of the budget that wasn't previously paying for district nursing because actually it's the right thing to do, okay. that's the territory we need to be getting into, where we're, we are using all of our resources in a different kind of way. Okay. Because actually, the benefits are we're doing more to keep we living well, safe at home, yeah. um, then that's going to be a good thing. And suddenly, and, and, and linking it back to the previous question about in a big organisation, we've got 14,500 people. It's really important that people don't see the work of the RPB as the six weekly meetings where a few of us get in a room together to talk about our plan. It is around how does everybody in the organisation think, well, what am I doing to contribute to better outcomes and win? And actually recognising that they, we, we can improve the system, we can improve the way that we're providing services to people. And it does require a bit of leap of faith to do things differently. And again, one of the things that I think RPBs are good at doing and RPB chairs um, certainly ours is always challenging us to think about um, let's not be afraid of having the difficult conversations we need good relationships and trust with one another to be able to do that but actually we do need to get into some difficult territory okay i will add on to that if i may abigail in the next round of uh, the webinar that's next week up in north wales we are going to be picking up in detail trust relationship social value forum forum so it's yeah. perfect that we are just headlining them here but we'll be looking at them in detail i've got seven more questions to come through but i'm asking everyone listening in tonight is this resonating how do you feel about the responses you're hearing so far are you reflecting does it feel right does it feel uncomfortable would you be happy to share and as i said everything you share with us is totally anonymized We'll just read out as you've just experienced here. So I'm having my heads up that the, the team behind the camera is telling me, hurry up, we know there's more questions <coughs> coming in. Okay, next one. <coughs> How do RPBs move from ICF and transformation fund allocation to leadership in whole system change? Rachel, I think this might be one for you. Or, or, are you going to have a go with this one? I'll read it once again, just have a think. How do RPBs move from ICF and transformation fund allocation to leadership in whole system change. Abby, can you come in on that as well afterwards? Yeah, That's yeah. okay. Yeah. Do you want time to ever think? Well, I, as I said earlier, the, the, the thing, the words that spring to mind is with great difficulty, but it, just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it can't be done. Yeah. Um, you know, I think unfortunately, the way that uh, the, the funding is allocated by Welsh Government, the whole, uh, the whole proposal process, the, the timescales are very short doesn't really give uh, RPBs much time to reflect, but actually, if we operated in the way that Sue, um, that Abby described, sorry, and I absolutely agree, you know, the, the partnership meetings are a meeting, they are not the work of the partnership, and so if all of that partnership work is happening, any good network, for anybody who's involved in any kind of business network, you know, you, you may meet every week, but actually, the, the real work is done outside of those meetings okay. where you keep talking to each other, you get to know each other. Um, so I think, um, you know, there is definitely a, a challenge from moving away from being what I described previously as, as being a bit of a rubber stamping uh, uh, sort of meeting to one where we do much more planning, we do much more challenging of one another, we spend time talking about what it is we want to do, uh, how we're going to get there and what good we look like. Uh, but right now, um, I think that uh, because we are so pressed as a, as a partnership board, and I can only speak from um, from my experience in contact with others, we are so pressed to, to, to get that money spent in the way that we said we spend it. Um, it is really difficult to take your eye off that ball and, and look elsewhere. But you know, if it can be done, uh, I think it just takes an awful lot of the, the work that Steve described where we need the, the partnership organisations to be to be embedding the work in the day job, and then the money it just allows us to do that work. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Can I have a bit of time? Yes, and very quick. Um, I think it's really helpful to have additional money to help pump prime the new things, but I think yeah. the risk is it becomes a distraction. Yeah. Because actually, we've got huge budgets that we've got to be reshaping and reprioritising and using differently. And for us. You know, it's the 220 million we spend in the community, not the 7 million we plant out of the transformation money or the ICF money. Mm -hmm. They are really helpful, but it is about how you get that system shift. I always refer to the pizza 
like um, in the healthier yeah. Wales, shifting the colours of the pizza. Uh, more in the community, less in hospital. Um, but it's actually about how you um, use pathways to change um, the system for the citizen, and that will require us to be able to mobilise and move our resources through the system too. Okay, Abby, thank you for that. Chris, I think this might be one for you. I'm just going to read out slowly. Um, thank you, folks, for all these questions. I promise I'll get around them. I'll get to get one panel member to respond to time. Really appreciate all your questions and observations. Um, Twitter's going a bit nuts as well, so thank you, folks. So, Chris, mm -hmm. the high level of members give uh, RPBs a good strategic steer yeah. and makes decision making difficult. How can we overcome that? I'll just speak again to give you time to have a think. The high level of members give RPBs a good strategic steer that makes decision making difficult. How can we overcome that? Uh, can I just, I mean, the mentions in that question, what do you mean, what does that mean by decision making difficult? Yeah. Is that around, I mean, having a lot of members, I think that's actually a valuable thing because diverse, diversity in your partnership is what brings is one of his great strengths. You need yeah. a, a large number of, or a number of people with different viewpoints and experiences. Mm -hmm. The notion of um, difficulty is that difficulty in terms of speed of decision making or quality of decision making. Um, there's a kind of a, a, a good thing to say: quick and wrong, or long and right. And sometimes some of these like things, that. some of these things will take time to get right. So perhaps the speed, it's it's, it's better to take time to get a, a right decision. So. Yeah. It's, it's not not a kind of yet yeah, all on on you know, all or nothing answer. And the other bit about difficulty in decision making, if it's about not not sufficient, you know, not good quality decision, I think that might come back to one of the other questions we've got about the type of data okay. the partnership boards use. Yeah. So every every way decision making is difficult. Okay. But yeah. So to come in on this, yeah, I think for me there's something about transparency as well. So if we're to include people. And we want their views. You have to be transparent. It does take time to share the intelligence, the data, agree what the priority is, and then implement whatever your plan is mm -hmm. collectively. No one person can do it on their own. I think it's a phrase you shared with me uh, last autumn in our partnership event. If you want to go fast, go alone. <laughs> That's right. If you want to go further, go That's together. Cool. Have I got that right? That's right. Okay, cool. Folks, I'm conscious there's several questions on data. I'm going to hold them to this next round. I promise I will ask them. So without further ado, let's move on then to data. So Duncan, what does good look like in terms of data sharing? And again, how do you get there? Because, you know, we need the what and the how, don't we? <coughs> don't we? You, need, you do. You need both. I think for me, the main issue around data sharing in a partnership context is one of uh, mindset. Um, have the partners around the table have an acceptance around the principle sharing data and that this is a good thing and that organizations need to be willing to share their data i think a lot of that is built up around a, um, an environment of trust and understanding within the partnership um, to some extent that only comes with um, with time and i appreciate that rpbs are still relatively new if you think about them in the context of the complex or generational issues that are the priorities in most areas in Wales. Um, the, the trust, the, the formulation of, of arrangements between partners is a, sounds like a dull thing but it's really important in terms of data sharing, um, especially around restrictions within the use of specific data sets around GDPR. Yeah. Yeah around other legal requirements you have around sharing personal and confidential information. Duncan, you can't underestimate trust, can you? You really can't. It's absolutely key. I don't mean to be chucking phrases out here tonight, but there's another one that comes to mind. Chris, trust arrives on foot and leaves on horseback. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and it is when we, and I fully appreciate the points we had earlier around mm. this being part of the day job and not seeing something different. But in a partnership environment, trust between colleagues is is the key to this, and that both operates at a partnership level for the the actual members of organisations who sit on the partnership mm -hmm. board, mm -hmm. but also at an operational level within the individual team within within organisations who will be sharing data, and that's that's something that takes time. Thanks, thanks, Robin. 
it's appreciated. Um, just to let you know, Duncan, there's several questions coming on data. A couple of them are quite similar, so I might just sort of condense them together. Mm. Abby, can I come to you on this, if that's yeah, okay? Um, I'm just calling on what Duncan said. I mean, to me, it's, again, it's about different levels, isn't it? So we need to enable our frontline staff to be able to share data where um, that's going to make um, the best decision making and, and enable people um, to do that well. I think sometimes people feel protected by the data protection legislation and not kind of hide behind it, but it's it's um it's sometimes I think um, gone to too readily in terms of reasons why we can't do something. And it's for me, it's more about reasons why we can and how do we make it safe and appropriate to do so. And I think then through through up through the tiers in a sense, there is something about how do our um, performance, how does that data come up to kind of en enabling us to have a set of performance metrics and kind of key indicators. Um, that enable our managers to work effectively together to, again to see across uh, across the system how things are performing and how things uh, need to be changed and one of the things we're looking at is how you get much um, more real-time data so that you can see if you're making an improvement in the system you're not waiting to look back over a quarter yeah, um, to, yeah. to what impact mm -hmm. have we had in terms of the change that we're making so one of the things that we're doing is is looking at um, trying to introduce a system where actually we get daily real-time data we we're doing that for parts of the hospital system at the moment and that's really brilliant with our clinicians to enable them to see what do we expect to happen this happened well that's good it's it's in line with what we're expecting because we've made a change and we're currently trying to join up between with the local authorities and the Welsh ambulance service so you get a whole pathway approach we haven't got there yet we haven't locked everything yet but for me it's about um, enabling us to see across the system and, and enabling people real-time sense of yeah we can improve them we can see what's happening thank you before i hand over to you stephen i think i've had some observations in from another citizen uh rep and this person says in response to what you're saying train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose always pass on what you have learned and then the third one is there is no try do or don't do no, I think I've said that wrong. I'll try that again. <laughs> there is no try, do, or do not. Yeah, it's a quote. Oh, is that where it came from? Okay, sorry. Oh, that's showing my ignorance. <laughs> so, on your thought then, Stephen, can I have your thoughts on data sharing, please? I mean, for me, in the whole thing, it's much work, and we're, we've actually got a piece of legislation 20 years old. Yeah. The ability to share information without the uh, individual's consent in order to prevent reduced crime. Well, we're still not cracking yet. I mean, what is it about the public service in the single public service mm -hmm. ethos? Um, we need to invest in data. <clears throat> and since austerity kicked in in 2010, what we've done is the opposite. We've disinvested in systems, we've disinvested in analysts, we've disinvested in data development. Uh, and and you know, the reality is, your Tesco's, your, your big companies invest a huge amount in business intelligence. Yeah. And that's why they get their marketing right, that's why they get their customer bases mm -hmm. right, that's why they get their services and products right. You've just put a different we angle on it, haven't you? You call it business intelligence <coughs> it business rather, than intelligence. De rather than data. That Doesn't that put a completely different ethos on it, doesn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of the types of data that we need to be investing in, it's the the causal factors and the protective factors mm -hmm. of the people that we're trying to help, support and serve. So it's not just about you know looking in the rear view mirror and what's happened, what the tragedy is, what the circumstances are, <coughs> and how we have to respond to those in crises, but what actually led, where could we intervene, yeah. what was the journey that that yeah. individual took, and the various points that we could have um, helped. So we need to be actually actively investing in that kind of data development and the analysts to actually look at it and researchers to yeah. work out what works and evaluate okay. it. So I like that term, data development as well. So I'm conscious you want to come in? Yeah, for me, there's almost a simple message isn't there. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. Uh, and it's almost that simple. You can let all sorts of systems or data protection legislation get in our yeah. way. The public expect us to share some yeah. information yeah. when yeah. public service. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it, it is that simple. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Rachel, do you want to come in? Yes, just, just a, a very brief point, which is about joining the dots. Um, and it's really, really important that um, we, get, we do join the dots. And we can only do that if we turn the data into intelligence. And then we, uh, you know, I talked um, to Sarah Mills, who's the head of our regional commissioning unit in uh, Kota for Ghana. We've got a data analyst that's just started with us, so that's fantastic. Hopefully, they'll be able to do some of the work that Steve's just described. Um, but we've got to get the balance right between 
quantity, quality, and impact. And if we if we can't get that right, we'll we'll never really know, uh, you know, the difference that we're making. And, and you know, from a uh, from an RPV point of view, I'd like to see our meetings where we spend a third of the time looking back, then a, a two thirds of the rest of the meeting looking forward, using what we've just talked about to say, okay, so this is what we've just been told. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do now that's different? Because if we carry on doing the same thing, then the thing will the thing will change. Why so, are you surprised you're going to get the same answer? Yes, the same response, right. isn't it? Yeah, yes. perfect. Thank you. Right. So, Chris, wrap this up for us in terms of data sharing. What's your thoughts got being going around the table? summarizing it i think it's interesting that i mean there are examples out there of people and there's people in processing here and there are people setting the tone in organizations that's a big big influence mm -hmm. on what people do and i keep thinking of listening to hugh jake way in an event i think he was in north wales where he spoke and he stood up and said i'd rather be stood in front of the, was it the information commissioner's yeah. office yeah. Um, being hauled up for inappropriate sharing yes. of data and standing in front of the coroner because someone yes, was injured as a result. And I think that sets the tone. Yeah. Places like fire and rescue services in the third sector are already in this space. And why can't others be there? And there's examples that go back to 2012, there's one, the Cheshire Fire Rescue Service, Age UK Cheshire, the health service was sharing data with Age UK Cheshire were then taking it from other data sources and identifying vulnerable people working with the fire service. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and kind of this is back in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. It's been done. It's a back to the future on this. So, yeah, lots of examples. And the other one thing is um, we talk a lot about behaviour change in public services, um, make it hard to do the wrong thing. And, and there's some, and uh, think about perhaps re, you know, designing some of these data sharing services that make it hard to do the wrong thing. So it would be more like you, Jake Quay. Mm, yeah. 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 And that's exactly what you think of saying. Well, I, I, I said that the flip, I said, remain focused on doing the right thing. Yeah. Okay. But then you're going to do the wrong thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, folks, you've had the panel's thoughts in relation to data. What are yours? What are your experiences? Do you want to share those with us? Uh, I've got some couple of questions already come in, but I've also got some uh, observations on Twitter again. Um, does the bureaucracy uh, inherent in public sector funding, and they've mentioned ICF, influence the production of planned mission statements removed from our citizens' everyday experiences? Nice one. I'll read it slowly once again. I love seeing the whites of the eyes of the panel members in the nicest possible way, because they're lovely. Does the bureaucracy inherent in public sector funding, ICF in brackets, influence the production of bland mission statements removed from our citizens' everyday experiences? And there's been a kind of response on uh, Twitter to this, um, saying that um, there's um, PGGCWWCP. Unfortunately, I'm not sure what that means. So if the team behind the camera can let me know um, what that means, that's what was coming on Twitter. They include the volunteer service user representatives at board meetings to obtain views from what uh, what's the point talk about in terms of moving the mountain, measuring the mountain, I should uh, beg your pardon, meant to say that one. It's not the West Wales. I think you might be thinking about yes. it now. Yes, yeah, yeah, they've just Wales. nodded and said yes. So that's the West Wales uh, Regional Partnership Board, okay? Just for me to make clear. Okay, so let's get some of these data questions uh, answered uh, then. Right, folks, there's several data questions coming through. I'm going to take this one from now because it actually combines several of what you're saying. So um, how do we show meaningful impact with robust evidence in 18 months, particularly for long-term impact projects? And how do we direct core resources based on that? Duncan, can you take the first part then? How do we show meaningful <clears throat> impact with robust evidence in 18 months, particularly for long-term impact projects? And so can I, can you pick up on how do we uh, redirect core resources based on that? Duncan, are you happy to take that? So, so the first point about um, showing impact, I think there needs to be a reflection at the start of all these processes that an awful lot of what we're trying to deal with here are complex or generational issues and that the the ultimate end goal is going to be something that is 10 or 20 years away. So that obviously doesn't necessarily fit neatly into what you would consider to be kind of traditional planning or reporting cycle. So the importance, one thing here is to have a variety or a range of milestones within your, within your priority. Mm -hmm. To have an eye set on the end goal, 
what ultimately good looks like, but to also include a series of um, shorter term outcomes that, that you need to achieve to get to the end goal and that they can be your way of showing showing progress in a, in a short term basis. Thanks, so, so the second part of the question, just to remind you, and how do we redirect core resources based on that? Okay, thank you. I think for me it picks up something that's already been said around the manual. Mm -hmm. Some of this is about having that leap of faith. Yeah. If you've set out your direction of travel, your priorities, and you know something is working, even if it's only 18 months funded, that should give you the courage, and it is, you know, it's a leadership yeah. challenge, I yeah. think, to actually say this is going in the right direction we're going to take one percent off our call yeah. and put more of it in today whether it's early intervention yeah. or prevention or another way of delivering a service in a different way okay. but if you get the rpb role mm -hmm. it is all about transformation it is a leadership function okay so you will have to make those difficult decisions okay right yeah. Kristen, can I, can I it's a really controversial thing to say though but shouldn't we be spending more time defunding the things that don't Good point. Let's put that out on Twitter, folks. <coughs> Christian, repeat that question for us, please. Uh, we've been talking about small amounts of money, mm -hmm. effectively, but actually, should we be defunding the things that we know don't work and the things we know cause things to be worse? Because I bet around the table there'll be a couple of people who went on each one of you all pick one out. Yeah, absolutely. Why aren't we defunding those? Yeah. <coughs> okay, right, the panel again excited. Abby, do you yeah. come back in? Let so me just, come just going back on what Duncan was saying. Um, I don't disagree that we do have, you know, we, some of this will be seen, um, the, the system ship over a longer period, but I think it is really important that we are able to demonstrate um, some of the only wins so that we've got okay. the evidence to say, yeah, we do know this is yeah. working. And, and one of the, the, the graphs that I use quite regularly and in our um, conversations about our RPB is some, is some information that the local authority have generated, which is if they have kept doing things the way that they have been doing, their use of um, hours of domiciliary care packets mm -hmm. would have been going up based on the aging population. Um, and because we've switched in the early intervention prevention service, it's plateaued and falling. Okay. But then actually we are doing more to intervene earlier and, and actually the packages of care that are going in are resulting in being lower because we've got in there quicker okay. and not escalated okay. um, and it's a really good example and you can see it physically. Thank you. Can we take information about that afterwards and share it with everyone else, right? Beth and can we pick that up afterwards and have you that's okay. Steve I'm sure there'll be examples everywhere. I'm sure it's, it's helpful sometimes yeah. to have something. Um before I come to you Stephen, I'm actually gonna post this question back at uh, people listening in. So how are you doing it? This you know it's not a one size fits all approach. How are you showing meaningful impact with or robust evidence in 18 months? Have you got have you have, have you managed that thorny question? Have you got something to share with us? Please do. So just to remind you how you do that, just in case you've forgotten, you can email it at good.practice at audit.wales. <coughs> on mentimeter.com, if you log on to their website, they'll ask you for a code and the number is 591918. You can tweet it at good practice WAO and use the hashtag. WAO RPB. Again, if you've got a Google account, you can log on to your Google, a Google account on the YouTube and they'll pick it up on the chat that's going on there. So, Stephen, I know you were chomping to come in there, so here's, here's your space. Yeah, I think that the key point I was going to make here on back to that collaborative commissioning of service, yeah. um, collaborative co design and co production of services, um, that, that really, as commissions, we need to be flexible in our contracting. Because okay. if, if we introduce a service that can yeah. make a difference, and we start to see it making a difference, but maybe we need a bit more of this and a bit less of that, we need to have the ability within our contracts to yeah. actually adjust as we go along. Okay. Uh, and obviously, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, we're talking about intergenerational issues, we're yeah. talking about long-term issues, okay. we're talking about behaviour changes. So those things take time to measure. Okay. We need to build that flexibility into our commissioning. I'm going to do a shout out then, if, see if anyone is doing flexible commissioning like that because we generally would like to hear if you'd like to share we'd love to be able to share that this evening there's a flip side to what the panel has just been talking about now um how do we mainstream and we haven't had the time to prove savings oh i can just i've just seen chris's reaction to this how do we mainstream when we haven't had time to prove savings are you wanting to come in on this one or i just started off i mean i think is should this be about savings is really the question I go back to if, if, the, if the point is good services for people if it's if your focus is just on savings you get a certain type of outcomes so actually think about what what are you trying to achieve and if it's just savings I 
open up to the wrong space. Okay, so you've had Chris's thoughts on this. Is that what you what you're expecting to hear? Because I'm I'm interested in this because it's a really good question. Because focusing on just the savings as opposed to a better quality of life, a better outcome. Yeah, I think, sorry. I was going to say that the reality is that we we are working in in an environment where there are really constrained resources. So it shouldn't be. Um, solely a question about saving it should be about how can we get best value for the citizen from the resource we've got and that might be balancing things up and down um, and, and and it's knowing where a bit of the system is is resulting in um, a higher level of value and actually it's the wrong outcome so if you take children on the edge of care um, who are about to tip into requiring care we know that we need to be doing a whole load more on that early intervention to stop them tipping, yeah. which we know will actually end up costing us collectively more than if we can intervene earlier. Same thing with ACEs. We know that children are going to have experienced yeah. our first childhood early yeah. experiences. We know all that work about uh, around prevention. If we can get in there earlier and work with families and children, um, that's actually going to give us better value and probably cost us less. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's it's a value question, not a savings question. Wow, I like that. Yeah. I like that. I really like so, that. Stephen? Yeah, I was just going to say that probably could be a really good example of this is um, the work we've done over the years in terms of youth justice. Okay. And the fact that <clears throat> by investing in early intervention prevention, youth services, all those kinds of things, We've managed in here in Wales to dramatically reduce the number of people being sucked into the criminal justice system, okay. which has then led to savings in criminal justice terms. Okay. But those don't necessarily get transferred back into doing more of what is effective. Mm -hmm. And as soon as austerity is hit, that we've cut youth services and we've cut some of that youth provision. What we've seen, we've seen massive increases in, mm -hmm. in youth violence, mm -hmm. life crime, etc. Mm -hmm. So you've got to keep on investing. Okay, right, folks. I've had the sign. I've got the time to move on. Uh, actually, uh, Stephen, I'm going to uh, get give the floor to you, if I may, on this one. It's governance. What does good look like in terms of governance arrangements, and how do you get there? The floor is yours, sir. Okay, um, it, it's a it's a big question. I mean, we've covered a lot of it already, but certainly um, we we need to be thinking differently, which means we need people who we send to our um, partnership boards sit down at the table. Um, they need to have the, the flexibility, the framework, the authority to sit there, to discuss these things, have the difficult conversations, as you said, um, and to take back those ideas in terms of different ways of working, you know, the, the user voice, the citizen voice, um, you know, those, those cri critical voices, if you like, you're not doing things right, you're not doing things well. Um, but I think fundamentally it does need to um, change the day job and the, the way that we do things. Um, I think we need to be, if we're going to work in partnership, we need to be prepared to give things up. You know, there's an old saying, you know, certainly from the times of uh, community safety partnerships where you know, it was a group of people um, sat together in mutual loathing and pursuit of funding, basically. You know, we, we, need to, we need to be able to say, actually, we'll do this differently if you do that differently, and mm -hmm. we will get these, these much better outcomes. Um, one of the other things that, that I hear so many times, and I see, I've seen it time and time again, is that, you know, organisation A will send somebody to a partnership meeting, <clears throat> and they will, they'll be there for that, and it might be children's services. Mm -hmm. So they'll talk about children's services, and they'll have a nice conversation with it. Then they'll go to another meeting, which might be about adult services, and they'll take their children's services hands off and put their adult services mm -hmm. hands off. Uh, and then yeah. when they go back to the ranch, they take both of those hands off and they put their council hands <laughs> off. And it, it's always about yeah. you know, every, every partnership meeting they go to, every organisation meeting, you are thinking about those themes that we're trying to address in the partnership. Um, I think, you know, we touched on service user involvement and citizens, I think you must, must, must have their voices at the very heart of what they're doing. Because you can design the best system and the best approaches in the world, but if it's in the wrong place at the wrong time, it's inconvenient, um, then, then people aren't going to use it, it's going to be a failure. I think we need to stop thinking in terms of geographical silos actually start thinking in terms of where the people live, how do they live, do they use the M4 for instance, or do they use the M70, and how many people from Philly um, look to Newport services, or do they actually look to Cardiff and you know, it's how people travel and how they live their lives, and, and that's what we set the part, is we need to be thinking, you know, rather than a Gwent service for people in Philly, because they're in Gwent, <coughs> actually maybe that's more about 
car lift service because they're just going to take that short trip down the road. You know, so I, I think we just fundamentally need to change um, our thinking. Okay. As, thanks for kicking off that. It's a really uh, grounded view as well. Sue, do you want to come back in on this? I'll add to that. Yeah, the, for me, there is something about the transparency of the arrangements. Uh, I mean, being part of the Measure in the Mountain Citizens Panel, um, one of the things that came strongly from there was people didn't know who the regional partnership board was, how do they influence it, where are the citizens panels. So if we really want these to be the machinery of making things happen, we've got to enable citizens to get around the table, be part of that decision making. That, that's a critical thing for me. Okay, so given what, what Sue was saying, Rachel, what's, what do you want to add to this? Given what Stephen said, what, this, what Sue said, what do you want to add to this in terms of governance? Uh, I think that uh, there does need to be, a, a, you know, taking on board what, what Stephen says um, about trans or transparency, etc. But I think we do need to be realistic about the complexity of some of the governance arrangements of each of the partners, and um, you know, they they are there for a reason. They are there to 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 protect and uh, and to to develop and progress the work of those individual members, um, but. Perhaps one of the honest conversations we need to have is about how some of those governance arrangements and that decision making, which we talked about in an earlier question, actually hampers the, the pace. So, you know, we wouldn't want to go fast on our own. But at the same time, uh, we, we need to be realistic about the fact that there are some decisions, particularly about disinvestment in current services, particularly about, um, you know, doing things differently. That, for example, a director of social services or a chief executive of the health board could not honestly make in that room at that time. They would have to go back to their own, back to the ranch. Yeah. They would have to go back to the ranch and they would have to, to check. So I just think that um, just being realistic about the other governance arrangements that are at play there is important. Stephen, do you reckon that? Well, I was just going to say another thing is, you know, and, and I hear this a lot is, well, is this dealt with by the RPD or is it dealt with by the Services board, or the community safety board, or the area planning board, uh, and, and the reality is, I mean, if people do remember local service boards and the, yeah. the region report that said yes. we, we need to overcome organisational complexity and these yeah. systems are just place based, okay. but there's probably enough scope in the legislation without anybody changing anything. Those chief executives to say this is nonsense. <clears throat> we just need to sit in one place at one point. And make those decisions, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a PSB decision or an RPP decision, we need to make those decisions. What would you say right at the beginning about One Wales? Yeah, a single public service approach and one that focuses on the place and on, and on the people we're trying to serve, rather Thank than you. on their organisations and the complexity that we build into these things. Chris is getting very excited there. I'm going to bring him in in a minute now. Before I do, though, Abby, do you want to come back in this? Thank you for that, Stephen, by the way. I mean, I think one of our jobs is also to make um, uh, to make sense of, of what looks like a complex picture. Um, so I hear what you're saying, but we work in a, an environment where we've got multiple different pieces of legislation, Wellbeing and Future Generation, which we started at the very beginning, yeah. the Social Service and Wellbeing Act, the Healthier Wales, um, a, a number of different policy frameworks. And in a sense, one of our jobs is to make sure that the golden thread that weaves through those things is really clear. So we are not duplicating, that we're really clear um, where there's a different role and responsibility in one place first and be clear on that and explicit so that we're not repeating and not duplicating um, and that we understand where the decisions can be made and where they can't be. Um, because I think there is a risk that you could say, well, we could put it here and these people could fit in the RPB or it could be picked up somewhere else. For me, it's about whatever the wiring is, and yeah. will, it'll be different in different places. Yeah, really absolutely. Have to authorities yeah. to work with, yeah. um, but we'll need to be accountable to the scrutiny committees and, and agendas. So for me, it's about making sure that whatever our wiring is, yeah. um, it makes sense for us locally and yeah. we're really clear what we're bringing yeah. to the RPB, what we're bringing yeah. to the PSBs, what we have to take back to our own organisations around decision making. Um, and where we can make it as clear as possible for people so people can understand where the decisions can be made and that we do it in a way that's as simple and straightforward as possible, always keeping the citizen in our in the forefront of our minds when yeah. we are making decisions. Absolutely. And it isn't just to, to sort of to reinforce, it's not a one size fits all approach, no. not one size. Panel, before I come to Chris, just to let you know, I've got seven more questions coming in. Data is on one of them, the relationships on another, but Chris, okay. Governance. Yeah. Um, citizens mentioned just uh, just a slightly to the side sort of view on this about engaged citizens or service users 
highest, most effective form of governance. And um, just to sort of play that out a bit, this is an example I saw last year over in, in Maine, in New England. Um, that say governance is most purest form is about making sure that organizations do the right thing, use the resources of this proposal for the benefit of the citizens. Mm -hmm. Why not involve those citizens in the governance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm involved okay. in uh, two cooperatives with the Valley Homes, yeah. uh, Cutrevy Both have got the service users and staff, mm -hmm. tenants involved in the governance of those organizations. Uh, Tony Bovard spoke about it at Public Service Summer School two weeks ago about how do you do that. And the example from uh, Maine, interesting one, um, it's thousands of miles away from here, it's nothing to do with social care, but there's something within the model that we might want to look at, in that they've got 5,000 miles of coast, which is, you know, Wales has got 900 miles, they've got a lot of coast. Yeah. They've got 3,000 fishermen individually working that. Um, with 1.3 billion into the local economy, which is quite a lot of money, but it massively supports local rural communities. And there's a phrase that goes around that we are working for the benefit of this community and our and our grandkids. And that's at the heart of what they do. And amongst all of these 3,000 people, they've got 50 fisheries officers. So this is incredibly thin layer of what, in other terms, would be regulation of governance because they've devolved it to the communities. Mm -hmm. They've got seven zone councils mm -hmm. across this 3,000 miles, and they talk about, we decide certain of the rules for ourselves and people within this community around who does what, uh, because they fit, the, and, they, and it's phrases, you know, people and fishermen talk about, it's the social, economic, and cultural, uh, you know, we're all different, you think it's interesting, you know, language is kind of quite not here mm -hmm. on every fishing boat, which I know you're yes, going to work the lobster about in West Wales. Yeah. But th the notion of that is what they've ended up with, by anyone's measure, it's a very productive and highly sustainable fishery mm -hmm. that just keeps growing and is maintaining mm -hmm. rural communities across 5,000 miles of coast. Um, these zone councils are the, are the ones that do it, and I see this bit about whether people are allowed to influence their own rules, their own rules that matter to their communities. How we translate that to social care, I'm not going to clue. Tell you what, then. There's so, a blog, um, folks, there's a blog that Chris has written on this. Beth, if you can look at the um, um, blogs that Chris has written for the Church of Yemen and send that one out. What's the title of the blog called, Chris? It's called... Imagine everyone working together towards a common end. Thank you. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Very, very quickly, right. that, 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 the um, example you just gave, Chris, doesn't that depend on two things? It depends on the community, the fishing community, knowing exactly what it is they want to achieve yeah, yeah. and trust. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that that governance can be devolved and all of those people can be involved is because they trust it. Yeah. Okay. Right, folks. Question time. Ready for this? Quite a few. I'm going to choose about four, three or four because I'm conscious of time. Okay. It's a data question. Data is only as good as the question is responding to. Often, the primary focus in terms of reporting is cost savings. I knew this was going to come back. As opposed to what matters for the individual. Switching the question often leads to cost savings as a consequence. I'll be able to read it once again because it's directed at you, if that's okay. So, data is only as good as the question is responding to. Often, the primary focus in terms of reporting is cost saving as opposed to what, ma what matters for the individual. Switching the question often leads to cost savings as a consequence. I mean, I think for me it comes back to what I was saying before about um, really thinking about value rather than cost um, and, and looking at um, how you can make. Um, the very best value with the resource you've got available. Would um, you make that distinction for me, value, cost, then? Let's so, give, give me so, a distinction. So um, I guess it's about um, triangulating between the outcome that we're trying to achieve um, and what's the, the most effective way of delivering that within okay. the resource that we've got available mm -hmm. to us and giving the right kind of quality and, and as I said, the outcome for the individual. Um, and um, for me, it's about um, really enabling our frontline teams to make the right choices. Okay. Um, and I think we are um, we are not as confident as we should be about putting decisions about resources. As far as you were you were kind of giving an example about that with your fishermen about you know, enabling the source and decision making to happen actually quite at a yeah. new level. Okay. We we get people signing things off by managers, and they've got to get their managers sign things off. And there's something about. Um, empowering people to think about how they can improve what they do 
um, and to make it on our frontline staff are all about um, how they can make improvements from a citizen point of view. I spent a couple of days up um, in the Toyota factory in North Wales um, um, and a few weeks back, a few months back. Um, and what was brilliant there is all their staff are trained in thinking up good ideas to improve the process. Now that is about ultimately making sure that the profit margins for the organisation mm -hmm. remain good, but actually their mentality is, no matter what job you do, um, and it was people on the assembly line going, I think I can make this better. It's actually make my job better and it'll make what I'm doing better. Okay. And okay, so we're not we, you know, we're not talking about assembly line production, but just that but it's the mindset. It's the there. mindset and the and the staff talk really positively about I am really okay. encouraged and empowered to come up with a good idea, make a decision, and and, and they get I get supported to do that. That's that last comment is vital, right isn't it? <coughs> so you want to come in on this, yeah, don't you? A similar theme in a way. When I was taught many years ago, uh, not even in the public service, uh, in, in the uh, private sector, uh, do the job and improve the job. Yeah. And I've always carried that with me. Yeah. And it's almost as if we've disempowered people yeah. Yeah. from the front line all the way up. Okay. Uh, and we're, we're almost forcing people into boxes, counting things, activity, and, and numbers are important, data's important. Yeah. But it's that phrase, isn't it? Hitting the target, missing the point. Ah, I so like that one. Are, yeah. that mode, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Right, I've got... Up on the, the point about yes, boundaries, which sure. Is absolutely I need brevity in this one. Thank you. Is that, um, you know, we do talk about cost too much value. What about the social value of some of these things? Yeah. So we, we not, might not be able to measure them in pounds, shillings, and pounds. Yeah, okay. But if they contribute to improving mm -hmm. our sort of social well-being, mm -hmm. then, you know, we shouldn't pull them out. No, we shouldn't. no, we shouldn't. Right, I've got a few more questions. Folks, thanks for all the questions. This one in relation to uh, mainstreaming good practice. I'm looking to Rachel and Chris to possibly come in on this one. So I'll read it uh, twice. How do RBBs mainstream good practice before they have demonstrated savings? Answer, it's not about savings, but about value and getting the best outcomes with our resources. How I'm going to say it once again to give you time to have a think. How do RBBs mainstream good practice before they have demonstrated savings? The answer that the, uh, the delegate is saying here, it's not about savings, but about value. Now we've got Abby who's given her take on the difference between value and, and, yeah, and getting the best outcomes from our resources. Chris, Rachel, who's coming in on first on this one? Uh, well, <laughs> Chris, do you want to go first? Not Volunteer by Chris. Okay. Um, so I think that the, the first thing, uh, I, I'm starting to feel as if I'm repeating myself, saying, but I think that you know we need to know what good looks like, uh, and, and then we we start from there. I mean, in terms of um, mainstream, if I can just look at the question Sorry. again. Yeah. Um, how do we mainstream good practice before we've demonstrated the savings? Um, I think we go back to the earlier answer that it shouldn't be about savings really. That actually, if we if we do the right thing, or we avoid doing the wrong thing, um, and we focus on this is what we have all agreed as a partnership is the right thing to do to achieve whichever one of those outcomes you know from based on the area plan, based on all of the work that we've, we've done through population needs assessment, etc. Um, <clears throat> the things that we are trying to achieve are not many; they they they're quite limited, really, but they're big. Um, and you know, and, and certainly in the case of Comtar Pagano, you know, very ambitious as I'm sure uh, what the other partnership boards are. Mm -hmm. We just need to make sure what the journey looks like, so that we know when we're going in the right direction, and when we're not. Mm -hmm. And then you know that that is what good practice is all about, isn't it? It's about saying, okay, we did this and that worked, and then but we did this with something else and that didn't work, and that maybe we didn't co-produce, we didn't involve the third sector enough, we didn't involve the citizens panels, for example. So. Um, you know, what I would say is, is that maybe instead of us sort of thinking too much about mainstreaming at this stage, we just need to make sure that we, we're all on the same path, we're all the same track. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris, can I have a on this one? Oh, so, do you want to come in? Yeah, yeah. please. Just yeah. thinking about that issue about mainstreaming, we yeah. have a unique opportunity here with the transformation fund, I think, to actually demonstrate we're brave enough to decommission something or remodel it if it doesn't work. Okay. It is a unique time. Okay, thank you very much. Chris? It's a little by little, some of these things, yeah. and it's a bit about if you want to it's, it's use the stepping stones, not leap the stream. Yes, right. okay. and, and, and that that's would be my uh, Okay, thank you. Right. I've got one more question uh, coming in. I need to answer uh, ask this one, and we've got to move on. 
Duncan is kind of responding to your observations on the 18 months. So it says, in terms of uh, showing meaningful impact in 18 months time, we need to take responsibility for our impact beyond our immediate sphere of influence, the wider ecology. So perhaps it should be about being relationship centered. I'll read, I'll read it once again. I think that's, yeah, I, I'm, I get a sense on the table you're going, yeah. So, through showing meaningful impact in 18 months time, we need to take responsibility for our impact beyond our immediate sphere of influence, the wider ecology. So perhaps it should be about being relationship centered. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I, um... There's a short answer, and then there's a complicated one on this one, I think. I get the sense, don't you? Yes, I think the point that we, we made earlier around people having to move funding about, okay. so you might have to spend a bit more on your service mm -hmm. to make larger savings somewhere else. Yeah. I think there's something like that involved in this issue. Um, the Scottish Government do a lot of work around contribution analysis, yeah. about understanding that a number of organisations or services mm -hmm have to work together to, to meet the priority and I think there's something around this one around short-term impact and understanding that your part of the solution might be hidden or unseen for a number of years where yeah. someone else may get for want of a better for, um, better term the immediate credit okay. yeah. the initial impact okay. and if they've got a good strong partnership relationship then people would be accepting and, and be able to work in a field where their impact is less seen. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Folks, I'm conscious of time, so I have to move on to the last question. So I need brevity and all this, please, if that's all right, I can't remember. Abby, I'm going to come to you first on this one, if that's okay. So I'm going to ask you, what does good look like in terms of joined up systems and how do they get there? That last bit is so important. Yeah, it is. Um, and I always think about it from being a citizen myself. Um, and yeah, in various well, we all are thinking about it. Yeah. You know, my dad, my in-laws, um, and and what it should feel like for them. Um, and, and as we were saying before, I'm an avid jigsaw puzzle doer. Um, very boring, I know. But for me, you know, it, the picture on the box needs to be really transparent and clear, so everybody under, can understand what it is we're trying to build here. And then from a citizen's point of view, when you've finished a jigsaw, you can hardly see the joins. Mm -hmm. So people can understand where all the pieces play an important role together in terms of a whole system. Um, and sometimes we're building our jigsaw. Some, you know, some people start on the edge and build a kind of frame, and some people start in the middle, and some it's colour. And we will do things in different colours. I've got to find the different colours. And we do it a different way. But, but, yeah. and, and sometimes you are having to make decisions without perfect knowledge. Um, and mm. you go, well, I'm not really sure where this bit's going to fit, but I know it's the right bit, and we mm. need to fit things together. So for me, it's from um, joined up from the, from the citizen point of view means that, that, that you can't really see those cracks between your organisations. For the lens for citizen, I can find my way through the system. We know that, that people tell us it's really hard to navigate their way through the system. Even those of us who work in the system um, trying to support our family members, it can be very difficult to find our way through the system. So for me, that is the kind of single most important thing. I think the second thing then is from our staff's perspective. Let's make it simple for our staff yeah. so that they understand where to go. So if you talk to teachers about emotional health and well-being, it's really difficult for them to know where do they where do they go to get early intervention and prevention support for, for a young person that they might be worried about without over medicalizing and, okay. and, and, and escalating to a level of service they don't need. So again, it's it's about enabling people who work in the system to know um, where where the next bit of the system is available to them and, and how they uh, get the right kind of support at the right kind of time to enable them to do the best job they can. And if that's about referring on or handing over, that they know that they're doing that confident that, that um, they are um, getting the right support for the individual that they're working with. Okay, that's lovely. Thanks, thanks for that. So, do you want to come back? Because I like the jigsaw analysis and sort of you've got the sense. And but the best thing about it is about the citizen as an individual. I could, yeah, I could see that would work for me. So thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, again, I would use uh, an opportunity we have in Wales, information advice and assistance. We've got that new system being set up now. Uh, so, if we can get all of our citizens much more in tune with accessing everything through that one route at your local authority level, we will help other people in the system get them to where they need to be. It's very difficult, isn't it, if you're not sure exactly what you need, how do I get there? So things like digital, websites, we ought to be 
use it then much more frequently, I guess, as ways of spreading out that information. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Chris, conscious of time, I need to sort of, in terms of joined up systems, right? Yeah, two things. Well, it's, it's You've in got a bit. couple of things you want to share, don't you? Yeah. And there are. Um, I think one is, is recognizing that a joined up system is, is this is complex. So just be conscious of avoiding the simple but wrong answers mm -hmm. and recognizing some of this is complex and will yeah. take time. The other bit is about um, I think how you do some of this. There are people, like I mentioned, fire and rescue services, the tone is set very much. As mm -hmm. Steve mentioned it, the partnership is the job. And one thing I've, I've seen around in the third sector, partnership is the job for these people, mm -hmm. and other other organisations would be more like the, like them, yeah. follow their lead. And I say, if the fire and rescue service can go out and do things like we're jointly unemployed with dementia advice, yeah, absolutely. Uh, who would have thought of that? <coughs> there are kind of things there that, that, that to be, yeah, do be, be, be the change you want to see kind of thing. So um, I'm just going to give a shout out now yeah. to everyone listening in. There's a lot of information being shared by this panel tonight. Really, really, some really thoughtful stuff. I'm asking you to reflect now and sort of like, what's the one thing for you that sort of is thinking, yeah, okay, that's what I'm taking away from today. Would you like to share with it, with, uh, share that with us if that's all right? I would really like to share it with the panel members, but also share it with people, uh, other people listening in. And obviously, I will anonymize and keep it that way. Um, talking of one key point, Abby, there's been a lot being shared on the table, and because you get to go first, you can choose whatever you like. Obviously, as I go around the table, there'll be less <laughs> and less, so you get to have, whilst you go first, you get to have the first bite of the cherry. So what's the one key point you'd want delegates to take away from what's been shared tonight? Relationships, relationships, relationships. That's right, Gordon and from the, with the citizen you're working with, with the colleagues you're working with, and with the members around the RPB who may change because of political change, what have you. Mm. Um, they they take time to build, they take time to get to know people, um, and and they're really important because actually this is hard going sometimes. Okay. Um, um, and you, it comes back to trust, but um, for me it is about um, the importance of the relationships and. and and having that common goal and desire to use those relationships to deliver better outcomes for citizens. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Before I come on to you, Stephen, um, uh, there's a tweet uh, coming in uh, for you here, Abby. Listening to this, they get data focused discussions at a local level need contributions of multiple partners to consider attainment of person centered outcomes, yeah. value for money, and impact on our systems. Yeah. Fundamental to this, a suite of measures to inform decision making. How do we feel about that, folks? We're all nodding around here, yeah, I think, yeah. No one, no one's going to disagree with that? No. I like that thought. Thank mm. you. Just a couple of for you. Stephen, one key message for the delegates that you'd like to, yeah. to share? One, one key message, I guess, is that it's the is that they don't. We need a single public, work, public service approach for Wales. We need to break those barriers down. Um, and we need to collaboratively commission services in place based on citizen services. Thank you. Thanks for that. Rachel. Uh, I guess for me that we are all in it together. If we are a member of the partnership board, then the decisions we make that are limited are decisions by us all. Um, so you know we need to, to, to be going away into our own organisations uh, and championing the work that we do as a as a partnership board member because as Steve said it, it, it is the day job so you know we are all in this together and I think that uh, it's the only way forward is if we actually take collective responsibility for that mm -hmm. um, and be honest about what we can and can't do. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. So what's the one key message for you? It's hard work, and it's worth it. Uh, and there, for me, there's something about taking time out regularly, pause and stop, and having yeah. a think, can we go in the right direction, go on that journey together. That's what this tonight is a lot about with that, because you can have these thoughts, these discussions with your colleagues in a very safe environment. And you know some of the things that you've said tonight, look, that some, some of the colleagues will think, oh, that's not me. But obviously, maybe tomorrow and sort of have time to say, well, actually, maybe I should be doing that a bit differently. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. What I would say, as, as a preface, one of the things that came out of the Academy Wales Summer School was this idea yeah. of giving us, it's not a luxury, because it should be stuff that we do all the time, but giving yourself the chance. 
either as an individual or as a team or as a service to sit back and think about what's going on and give issues time and the justice they deserve. My one key point from tonight is that we need to measure impact. We need to understand what difference our services are making to really understand whether we are doing the right thing and that involves talking to citizens and people who use the services to understand what difference they make. Thanks for that. Thanks, Duncan. Chris, before I come to you, I'm just going to check with the team. Any final observations, thoughts coming through before we wrap this up in a couple of minutes? Just check in. We're good? Okay, thanks. So, Chris, what's your one key message? My number is a caveat. It's all about the love. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it really is, actually. So, yeah, picking up on relationships. It's, I think, uh, conscious like being married. And I just celebrated my 30th wedding anniversary. And my wife's on the phone to my, my mother at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, I think you both... That's love. That's love. It is love. I mean, you both got to have something you believe in. Uh, you need to get to know each other, which is a really important part of developing trust. And you've got to need to do what you say, which is part of the yeah. trust as well. And I say it's okay to disagree on things. A bit of you know constructive de de uh, debate is fine. And I think it's okay to have friends outside of the marriage or the partnership because they add to the richness of what's going on and take that further on. But yeah, it's all about the level. Okay, thank you. So folks, I'm just, just going to say to you now in terms of, you've heard some really thoughtful observations some challenging observations this evening. Where are you when you head with this? Would you like to share it with us? More than happy for you to continue sharing on Twitter, on email, and we pull it all together if that's okay. So just to remind you, um, you say thanks first. Thanks to the team behind the camera. Much appreciated. Yeah. Much appreciated. Can I say thank you, Abby? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Sue. Okay. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to our audience. And just to remind everyone, next week up in Llan Roost in the Glastier Business Centre in Conoy, we'll be having a second round of these webinars. And again, they'll be televised, recorded, and we'll take it down and transcribe and translate and put it back, back up in a couple of weeks. I need to say thank you to you folks for all your lovely questions, your, your challenging questions, I really appreciate it, because this is all part of sort of understanding where you're at in terms of the journey in relationship in relationship to, to the regional partnership, board, partnership boards. Did I say partnerships? I didn't mean to. I honestly meant to say partnerships. I do apologise. I really have I need my next cup of tea. So thank you very much to you. Dunin Dunin am a Kevnogis in no. Dunin Dilkarian and Eidoch Questioner. Osma in the question to he and Lina Vichy Cloetino. I'm happy to come in it. So firstly, I'd like to say on behalf of the Good Practice Team of the Wales Audit Office, the lovely panel who have actually answered all the questions. I'm not frightened, uh, shied away from any of them, and I've been happy to give you know constructive challenge to panel members across here. I'd like to say thank you very much. Jochen Bal, Nostar Hoil, adiós. <laughs>